I'm reptile expert Mark O'Shea, and I'm on a quest for crocodiles. Not just any crocodile, but a mystery. A crocodile that lives in a desert. I've got him, I've got, I've got a thing on his tail, man. How did it get here? How can it survive? The largest desert in the world, the Sahara, holds the answer. Okay. Crocodile! I stepped on him. I stepped on his tail. Come on, do it. That's it. Crocodiles are the super predators of the reptile world and are lethal in their element, water. They live in it, mate in it, hunt in it, and make a meal out of almost anything that comes near it. And the most dangerous of all are the Nile crocodiles of Africa, man-eaters that grow to over 20 feet. All crocodiles need water to survive, which is why it's so incredible that the crocs I'm after are said to live in the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert is the largest desert in the world. It covers an area of some three and a half million square miles. About the size of the United States of America. My search for the crocs will take me right through this landscape, which is tough going on two legs. Temperatures can reach a scorching 120 degrees in daytime and drop to a frost at night. People have entered the Sahara never to be seen again. So I'm going to need a strong, reliable vehicle in this place of extremes. We've got this truck to get a, all our camp gear right out into the Sahara. It's broken down. On a blacktop road. OK, we have to, to push it a little bit. We have to push it. Jolly good. Hemo Nickel is a reptile expert from Germany. He's studying the reptiles of the Sahara, but he's only seen the desert crocodiles we're after once before. Oh, you don't have much chance of pushing this. Let's fly into the moon. <sighs> We've abandoned the truck as we have to move on. The desert crocodiles must be the northernmost population of crocodiles in the whole of Africa. In all of Africa. It just occurred to me that this is actually the nearest wild population of crocodiles to Europe. Up to now, we don't know exactly what they are. I have a, a, a theory about this. Um, the worst species of crocodile in North Africa that are extinct now. Now, who's to say that this isn't um, a relic population of one of those extinct species and not really a Nile crocodile at all? So it would be very interesting to first measure them, mark them, um, getting DNA samples. But the problem is we have to catch them. We have to catch them. First, we have to get there. It's a gruelling two-day journey into the West African country of Mauritania. We travel through Nouakchott, once a nomadic camp, but today the largest city of the Sahara. Then further into the desert to Matmata, a rock pool in a canyon where Hemo saw the crocodiles. To get there, we have to pass through the sand dunes of Mujeria. It's a journey of danger and endurance, and it looks like we're stuck here for the night. But Hemo has something interesting he wants to show me. This little snake is one of the most dangerous snakes in northern Africa. It's a carpet or saw scale viper. And it has a unique method of defense that conserves moisture. The scales on the sides of its body are arranged in a different pattern to those on its back. They've got ridges and they're serrated. 
So when it rubs its coils against them, rubs its coils together, creates a soaring sound. Listen to this. A sound that would stop any animal in its tracks because animals know that that means danger, which means that it doesn't have to hiss. Therefore, it's not breathing out moisture. And in common with many other desert snakes, the keel scales will collect dew in the early morning and the snake can then lap moisture off its body, thereby obtaining a drink. The carpet vipers of North Africa, with their short, rapid, jabbing strike, are responsible for a huge number of human snake bite fatalities. It's not only snakes that can bite in this desert. Two years ago, Hemo saw crocodiles in the rock pool we're heading for. The question is, will they still be there? It's evening and the light's dropping fast. Behind me are the Tagant Hills, where the desert crocodiles live. We've got to climb up there tomorrow. The Sahara covers three and a half million square miles, but not all of it is sand. Our quest for the desert crocodiles takes us through many different terrains, all of them defined by their lack of rainfall. Like this weird lunar landscape, a stone desert, and the domain of the spiny tail lizard. I've got him, I've got, I've got my finger on his tail, man. Okay. But this is a spiny tail lizard. No. Spiny tail lizard is a typical North African desert lizard. And he's built for getting into gaps like this. He'll inflate his body and wedge himself in. And what's more, he's got a very spiny tail which blocks the uh, entrance. He's actually between two slabs. Oh, we might be able to get this rock up. Keep going. Ah, la, la. Put it up again, because you've actually put it down on my hand. Now. OK, now. Yeah, it's a small meal. Now you can see how difficult a spiny lizard is to extricate. He's flat, so he goes straight in between the cracks in the rocks. And this is all very loose skin, and he can sort of pump himself up a bit and fill the space. And then most of all, this spiny tail does two things. First off, if you're approaching from this end, you're getting the spikes sticking into you, and it makes it difficult to grip. And secondly, you can slide something in, but it's harder to pull out against those spikes. Water means life in these hot, dry conditions. This creature has evolved a method of desert survival by absorbing the tiniest amounts of water through its skin. But how do the desert crocodiles survive? Almost at the mouth of the canyon that holds the rock pool where Hemo saw the desert crocodiles. But the vehicles can't get any closer. This is where we'll set up base camp. We have our own desert survival measures. We've brought a doctor and medical supplies with us because we're too far from any hospital to survive a serious snake bite or crocodile attack. And tomorrow we'll reach the lair of the desert crocodiles. But before it gets too dark, I want to look for signs of other desert creatures. Now, for my money, that's a snake trail. I'd say this is the track of a sand snake, fast-moving, backfang snake that's active during the day hunting lizards. It's not contacting at every point. It's moved across here rapidly. It's not a sand yeah. snake. Hmm? It's not a sand snake. That's too, um... That's more viperine now, isn't it? Yeah. Sand snakes are going to go like this. Whereas the viper is going to go more like this. It's a good track, though. Definite snake. Down here. Down there. Way. There by your foot. Did you just make these with a stick? Yeah. Here. No, yes, no yes. Sticks. That's a beautiful track. Where's he go from there? There. There. There he is. I've just seen the snake go through, round your side. I can see him. Don't move. Don't move. I can see him. There. He's there, climbing. Look. Oh, there he goes. 
Down. He's going. Ow, ow, ow. <laughs> this is evil stuff. <laughs> Wait. Don't move. I can see him, and I might be able to reach him. He has gone up. I'm going to try and stand up and grab his tail. Don't anybody move. <sighs> On up. to bits here. You need a stick. No. Got him. I've got hold of him. I've got him. I'm covered in thorns. I'm bleeding. I'm but I've got I've got the sand snake by the tail. And I've okay, now got him okay. by the body. That's okay. <laughs> Perfect. There it is. Um well, that's the snake court, but um, I'm stuck. Desert creatures like this sand snake have evolved strategies to survive. One of the most interesting things about sand snakes, and one of the least understood, is their ability to secrete a waxy substance from their nostrils, which they then coat the entire body with by writhing around. This has been observed, but nobody's really sure why it does it. Possibly, it's pheromonal. A female to attract a male. Possibly, it's water-resistant, waxy material that will actually make the gaps between the scales waterproof and prevent water loss through the skin. But nobody really knows. Without water in the desert, a creature would die, which is why I'm so interested to see for myself how a reptile that lives in the water, like a crocodile, can survive out here. For people in the desert, it's not just lack of water. The heat can be lethal. Protection from the sun is essential. I'm wearing a typical Arabic shamar, which also protects against wind-driven sand. We're very close now to where Hemo remembers the croc pool to be, but I can't see any sign of water. There it is. Just see the water now, but can't see the crocodiles. Incredibly, there is water here, but that's no guarantee that the crocs Hemo saw two years ago will still be around. They've rarely been seen and never filmed, so if they're here, they'll be easily spooked. Crocodile! Yes. In the morning. Yes, he is. The second one basking. Yeah, I'll look inside. So there definitely are still crocodiles in here. And that's, I'd say, about eight foot. Yeah. That's a big one. That's big, yeah. And if we could mark them. So. You can. See the same individuals year after year. Yeah, and just and if they move to another population, you'd recognize them. Yeah. And with the DNA, of course, to see how close they are to your typical Nile crocodile in the rest of Africa. DNA could also prove my theory that they might be a different species altogether. I can only see four or five crocodiles and no babies. You couldn't sustain a healthy population with so few crocs. If this is all there are, we could be looking at the last generation of the desert crocodiles. The only way they could survive long term is if there were other populations nearby. The important thing is trying to see if there's any babies. It's a very strange environment for crocodiles. It is. It's an incredible location for a crocodile, and it's the very first time these crocodiles have ever been filmed. We need a croc for Hemo's research, but this rock pool looks very deep and the crocs are very alert. Hemo says there are other rock pools in this canyon. Maybe there are crocs there too. Maybe even a baby. These crocodiles are, are much smaller than your typical Nile crocodile of tropical Africa. Because crocodiles are limited in their size by where they live. There's no point in a crocodile outgrowing a pool like this and having to move. 
they grow to a certain size and seem to stop. And the biggest crocodiles in here appear to be about eight feet long, which is probably the maximum size that even in the wet season these pools could cope with. But even if these are under half the size of normal Nile crocs, they still share the same watery adaptations. Second eyelids for underwater hunting, nostrils that close underwater, and a special sixth sense. Sensors along the jaw that detect the slightest movement of prey in water without the need for sight, sound, or smell. And there's no reason to think they're any less dangerous. This is the breeding season for Nile crocs. If these are Niles, we need to be careful. Mothers will protect their eggs, and it's a dangerous time to approach them. Normally, you wouldn't go near a nesting site without an armed guard. But as I'm here, what the hell? Here. Yeah. yeah. That's a croc print. She's scrabbled up, and you can see where her belly's gone over, and she's flattened it down. So this is, I think we'll go in and have a look in that yeah. one. You can see that the crocs have been up here. Whether they've been doing anything other than just lying here is uh, the big question. There are no signs of eggs or baby crocs, and we haven't seen enough crocodiles here to sustain this population. Beautiful, aren't they? Our only hope is to explore the other rock pools in the canyon. In the desert canyon where the crocodiles live, it's so hot that these smaller rock pools are drying up at a rate of an inch a day. Each pool is home to around a thousand catfish, a crocodile's banquet. But are there crocodiles here? Oh, look here. Are they croc tracks? Yeah. It's look been here. curled yeah. and gone back down there. Yeah. Tail drags. And uh, here we have the evidence. This is uh, uric acid. It's the crocodile equivalent of urine. And um, it's quite paste-like, it's dried down. So very little moisture lost with that. And with these pellets, which Emma says uh, composed largely of fish, and that's not surprising, the catfish are here. Very efficient kidneys. And that's necessary, because it doesn't want to waste water. Big one, yeah. It is. That's, that's a decent size for the catfish yeah. here, so that would place it somewhere back here, wouldn't it? Yeah. But this <coughs> is going to be, I would think, a major food source for the crocodiles here. Would you agree, Emma? Yeah. Probably the major source. Yeah. There are some very good croc prints here from a small croc. Going back and forth from the big pool to this small one. And you can see the small fingers of the front foot and the long hind foot with the webbing. You know, these deeper pools could quite easily have a croc sitting in them. Dried up riverbeds, like the Crocodile's Desert Canyon, are a reminder that the Sahara was once very different to its appearance today. How these crocodiles got here in the first place might be revealed by the landscape. The Sahara scoured with remains of ancient waterways and boreholes like this, which have been created where water swirls a hard rock deep down, cutting into the bedrock. They're all sure signs that this was once a raging torrent. But if you look across the rocks and the dunes, it's hard to believe that this could ever have been the case. Only 5,000 years ago, it was a green savanna with flowing deep rivers and brimming lakes. It's continually moving and changing. At one point, the Sahara disappeared altogether. At another, it reached almost to the equator, only to shrink again, leaving behind watery savanna grasslands. 5,000 years ago, changes in climate started a process of expansion southwards. So the lush green savanna has been reduced to this dry, barren wilderness. And the desert crocodiles are all that remain of populations trapped and isolated out here. And the few we have found may be the descendants of the crocodiles that flourished in this area 5,000 years ago, just surviving on what little water collects where the rivers once were. Today, the canyon at Matmata still gets rain, but only once a year. 
Although they call it a wet season, it's more of a 48-hour flash flood. But it's so torrential, it carries trees, sheep and goats with it. And I would now be several feet underwater. Maybe the brief but powerful flood also carries the crocodiles with it through the canyon, dropping them at rock pools along the way. The pools in this valley are like beads on a necklace. There's a whole string of them all the way down. And when a crocodile finds itself in one that's drying out, it simply up sticks and walks to the next one. So far, we have evidence of five crocs, not enough to sustain the population here, and there is no sign of any breeding. But maybe the full story is not limited to this canyon. We're following up an intriguing lead. Uh, a couple of fishermen have told us that they know of a pool outside of the valley where we've been searching that contains crocodiles. And we're hoping to get them to take us down there see if we can see them. Okay, here we are. This is it. Hello. Yeah. Mm. Those are the same catfish that we see up in the uh, yeah. in the in the river. We've seen a lot of catfish, and they are the primary food of the crocodiles in that part of the river. Crocodiles around the world like to eat catfish. Do you attrap the poisson? Où? Poisson? Oui. At matin. D'accord. They're catching so, them in the valley, in the valley over where the there. crocs are, yes. Yeah, and baker. Uh, in the rainy season, the, the fish um, wash down and seed the pool over the place. Yeah. yeah. You go. We are here. The fish, they try to. Um, Get yeah, back while there is still in water the, in the rocky areas. It's the same thing with the crocodile, they are yeah. washed down yeah. here. Mm. And, and then in the dry season, they're walking back. They try to get the... back, but a large number of them will actually get end up on dry yes. land and all, all perish. It certainly seems that the crocodiles from Matamata are not just being swept down the valley, they're actually being swept out onto this huge floodplain where the water in the wet season can extend seven miles in that direction and as much as 80 miles in that direction. There's actually a lake over there, a permanent lake. And it's quite possible the crocodiles are even getting as far as that. To find our lake, we follow the course of the ancient rivers. The desert is a hard place to survive. Even our tents offer no hiding place from the extreme heat or grinding sand kicked up by the strong desert winds. As night falls, the camp is besieged by an horrific creature, a scary monster that has evolved savage ways to survive in the desert. Look at that, that's the stuff of nightmares. That's a solifugid. It's sometimes called a camel spider or a sun spider, and it is a true desert inhabitant. And they live in burrows. At night, they come out hunting, and they are active predators, often entering camps to search for prey. And we must have had two dozen of these come through the camp in the evenings. It's adapted to live in the desert, obtaining all its moisture, either from the humidity of its burrow or from its prey. It sucks the insides out of its prey. You're not going out. That is fast. Look at them running. The idea of this thing grabbing hold of you, wrapping its legs around you, and then using its two pairs of jaws to cut into your finger is decidedly unappealing. There he is. 
This Soli fugid will take on almost anything. It'll kill big tarantula spiders. It'll cut scorpions in half. There's not many things that Soli fugid's frightened of. It lives to eat, and it runs fast and hunts down and ambushes its prey. And it moves like lightning, rather like the cameraman's about to do in a moment. <laughs> 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 Whoa, you had me then. <laughs> we've established there are crocodiles in this desert, and we've found evidence of a few of them at other rock pools down the canyon, but we've not determined if they're breeding. I want to investigate the valley above Hemo's croc pool to see if there's any sign of crocodile life up there. When the floods come, this rock face is an 80-foot waterfall. It's a pretty strenuous climb for us. The chances of a crocodile climbing up and out of here must be zero. Above the croc pool. They can't climb up the rocks, so they haven't come from there. This means there must be crocodiles in pools at points up this river, which actually means the population could be larger than we have first assumed. This is a fantastic discovery. The first pool of water we reach above Hemo's croc pool has a crocodile in it. There must be more, but it's impractical to search every pool in the valley. We need local knowledge to help us. Okay. Well, come out that. Uh, one hole. That's the other one. Hold it. The hold it. The hold it. This is a traditional nomad turban. And it's designed to stop your talking. And to keep the sand out. Of your mouth. And in some parts of the Sahara, where water is really scarce, they even pound the dye in with stones rather than soaking the dye in. And they never wash them, conserving water. They wear them till they drop to bits. So there you have it. Not many nomads have their own personal dresser. Easy. Well, that's a cinch, isn't it? That one there. OK. It's more comfortable than some of the cars I've ridden around in. OK. OK, we're up. Hello. Hmm? I put it on a par with riding a water buffalo and uh, somewhat easier than riding an elephant. For centuries, the nomads were known as the kings of the desert, lords of the great caravan routes along which flowed salt, slaves and gold. They have been shrouded in myth and mystery, and they are the undisputed masters of finding water. There are around two million nomads throughout the Sahara. Most nomads in Mauritania belong to the Moorish tribes. They have learned to survive years without a single drop of rain by moving between temporary water sources. This year is especially dry and difficult for them, but amazingly, there is always enough water for tea. And more tea. And more tea. No <laughs> harm. <laughs> We've got a bottomless pot of tea here. We'll be running, to, running behind a tree all the time. Nomads are known for moving from waterhole to waterhole, 
so I was surprised to find out that these nomads have been living in the same spot for 20 years, rearing goats. Goats need water, and where there's water, there may be crocodiles. We would like to know where they're watering their goats, because if there are any big pools, they may contain crocodiles. Uh -huh. In this place you have a crocodile. He knows somewhere where it's yes. crocodile. Yes. There are a lot of them. A lot of really? crocodiles. A lot of crocodiles. That's that's good. And all what size? Are there any baby crocodiles? You see, if you have a baby for hoodie, if you have plenty water coming. What is in English? Yeah, rain, rain. Rain coming. It brings more crocodile. So place. babies come from further upstream yes. then? Baby crocodiles. The nomads tell us there are baby crocodiles. Catching a baby croc would be our biggest prize. Not only would it give us the DNA sample we need, but also be proof that the desert crocodiles of the Sahara are breeding. We have to check out this pool. It's going. Yes, yes. 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 Gone. Gone. Baby crocodile, though. Baby, definitely baby crocodile. That's exactly what we wanted to see. This was just one of a network of pools the nomads directed us to. Who knows what we'll find in the others? One there, and there's more further on. And here are some pretty fresh prints of a croc going into the water. So hopefully, still in here. I'm certain there is a croc in this pool. We're going to try and net it, but there is a disadvantage. We have to get in there with him. The net isn't wide enough to cover the whole pool, so what we're trying to do, with a good slip by on either side, is just disturb that area and drive anything yeah. He's gone through it. That was him. Yeah. He went through the net. He is in here. I felt so. that. A strong animal. He's in. He's in the net. Do you feel that? Yeah. Is he there? Still there. I think you think he's there. There's some weight in the net. No. No? It's hopeless. There are muddy hollows all over this pool. The crocodile could be anywhere, but Hemo has another plan, a tried and tested method. And this rope will be attached to the bait, a chicken. And when he gives that a tug, the leaf spring goes up and the noose tightens around the croc. But will this trap catch us a croc? Only time will tell. After dark, the Sahara is a hazardous place to be. And I would like to introduce you to another of the dangers of the desert. It's totally dark here, but with the ultraviolet light. Totally different picture. Scorpions glow an eerie green. This is caused by almost a natural sunscreen in their exoskeleton, which may be to protect them from the ultraviolet rays from the sun, except that they're active at night. And they are responsible for numerous human accidents. In fact, in some parts of North Africa, Scorpions kill more people than venomous snakes. You have to be careful with scorpions, but you can tell which are likely to be dangerous by looking at their claws. The scorpions that rely primarily on their brute force have large claws. Those that rely much more on the sting from the tail have slender claws. If you look at this fellow, he has slender claws. His tail does the business.
We've come back to the pool where we saw the baby croc. We are desperate to catch it, so we've adapted a jungle technique for the desert. A nighttime croc hunt by boat. My flashlight will show up the eyes of any crocodile in here. That's a big rock we're going to stick on. That's a big rock. Go to this side. But we have to be cautious, because where there are babies, there could be protective parents. There he is. See, both eyes are looking downstream. I've seen one, but these crocs have never been filmed before, and they're easily spooked. He's gone under. Not the small one over there. They're all going under. There he is, look. Yeah, it's... There are a lot of crocs in here. We've seen a small one that could be a baby, and a big one's gone under these rocks. I'm going in after it. The boat isn't going to work. Crocodiles can be dangerous. I don't make a habit of swimming with them. Some list human beings on their menu, but this is the only method that might get me close enough to catch a croc. foot on his tail, but I can't reach it, and it's moving, <laughs> and it's deeper. <laughs> I stepped on the croc, so it drops away, and there's an awful lot of trees and stuff under there, because, of course, the river's just forced everything down. I don't know where it is now. Last time I did that to a gnar crocodile, it bit me waders in half. The bright eyes of a crocodile make it easy to see at night. The problem is making sure they don't see me in a spill of Hemo's light. Don't light me up. Don't light me up. I'll stay still. I can't do within five feet of him. If I can just creep up on him, I can grab this one. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. I haven't got him yet. Gone. Is he gone? Uh, gone. There's another one over there. In the shallow water. Gone. There's one. One back there. there are crocs all around me, and I'm getting really cold. God, I'm freezing. I think it's about six or eight, at least. There's one. Oh, bloody hell, that's a big one. It's gone again. Right, down by the boat. Just coming out for a bit. So I'm freezing. <laughs> Just when I thought we'd failed, Hemo spotted our baby near the bank. But can he get it? The baby croc's calling for help, and there are plenty in this pool that could answer it. Well done, Emma. Well done. There you go. And that's the baby alarm call. Mm. 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 
If Mum's here now, she should by rights come thundering over here and beat seven bells out of hello. Because that's what that's designed for. That's the baby alarm call. We got one. We got one. We got one. And importantly, we got a baby. And and that's what we've been wondering about whether the whether this is a breeding population and clearly it is because this yeah. is less than a year old, isn't it? Yeah, it's from last year. Last hatching. year, and last I mean year. they would only be laid eggs now yeah. for this year, wouldn't they? So, uh, but the big question is, you can't have a baby without parents. Henry didn't saw anything. So. Well. I've swam up not, down here, really big enough I've swam to up to there. several, and I yeah. haven't swam up to anything that was big enough to be an adult crocodile, even an adult pygmy. Yeah. Now, croc. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, I know, I've seen that trick. Somewhere, these babies must have parents. But where are they, and why can't we find them? Instead of answering questions, we seem to be finding more puzzles. Perhaps tomorrow, Hemo's crocodile trap will have caught us an adult. I can see the top of the trap. I can see chicken legs, not a thing. But look here, belly prints. Crocodile's been lying in here, but it didn't fancy the chicken. And yet it's, it, it's come close, but it hasn't gone far enough. It's still not evidence of any parents. Mind you, it means we've got a chicken lunch. We've established that the crocodiles in the desert seem to have a smaller maximum size, and that's probably an environmentally limiting factor. They also lay fewer eggs, which is natural from a smaller female. But Hemmer's research has shown that the hatchlings are actually smaller too. Now that must be a genetic thing. The females are producing smaller hatchings, 20% smaller than those in East Africa. That is genetic, and that begins to suggest that we are actually looking at a pygmy race of crocodiles here. One, two, three, four. Hemo needs to measure and mark the baby crocodile, so if he catches it in the future, he can see how much it has grown, or monitor whether see. it has travelled to another pool. See, he doesn't bite the tape measure. Yeah, that's Oi. the problem. I'll just uh, pull these jaws shut. At this size, if they bite you, Seven. the teeth are like needles and the jaws exert quite a bit of force, so it, it does sting and it certainly bleeds. But at this size, it's more the surprise of the bite and the speed of the bite that's disconcerting. Pull it two. When I remove my finger, if you're quick, when the eyelid opens, you'll see the inner eyelid pass over, the one that converts his air-seeing eye to a water-seeing eye. Go on. There. Along the jaws, you can see another of its water adaptations. These dots are the receptors, sensitive to anything moving in the water. And, of course, it has webbed feet. OK, you can snip. DNA is what we came for, and a snip of tail from this baby will provide the first ever sample of DNA from this desert crocodile population, determining in years to come if this is a pygmy race of Nile crocodiles or a completely different species. He didn't flinch at all. I doubt if he even felt that. <laughs> I came searching for something that shouldn't exist. Desert crocodiles. And I found a population divided by a waterfall. Above the waterfall, there is a breeding population, but there don't seem to be sufficient youngsters to sustain an ongoing population. I have to say, I think their future is bleak.
frontier for Africa's crocodiles. The desert crocodiles are living proof of the Sahara's fertile past and have survived for thousands of years despite the advance of the desert. But as I took a final look at the canyon of crocodiles, I spotted even more rock pools strung out further up the valley. More potential breeding grounds, and I can't help thinking, a reason for hope.